This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode 45, with guest Laura Probosco. Any links and resources you hear in this episode can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash four five. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Episode 45 today with my friend and colleague, Miss Laura Probasco. Let me tell you a little bit about Laura. Laura Probasco is a licensed clinical social worker, registered play therapist supervisor, founder of Probasco and Associates, and co-founder of The Art of Play, an organization that provides play therapy trainings to individuals, schools, and organizations. Laura was born, raised, and still raising in Kansas City, Missouri. She has traveled the world and worked with charter schools, children, and adults of all walks of life, and is well-versed and studied on the works of Brene Brown. Watch out is all we can say about this one. You are in for a treat. So here we go with episode 45. Okay. Hey, everybody. Episode 45 is here, and I'm here with my friend, Laura, and we are going to talk about something very serious. No, very serious. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about serious stuff here on the Orchid Gas Live podcast, but I, I hope that we do it in like a, you know casual manner where it's like you're having coffee with me and the guest that I have on. We talk about shit that matters. So nothing less today. I have Laura Probasco. You already heard all about her. So say hi to all my peeps, Laura. I'm excited to be here. Hello, everyone. My ass kickers. That's what I call them. So you can refer to them. Okay. (laughs) We will... From now on, it's Ask Kickers. That's all I know. Yes. That's all I know. Okay. Um, Okay. So you guys, I met Laura at, can I tell the story of like when you first came up to me right outside the bathroom? Oh, when I stalked you? Sure. Yeah. You go ahead and say that one. (laughs) At least it wasn't in the bathroom or like poking your head (laughs) under the stall. Um, I I did hear that happened. We, I haven't had that happen yet. We were at the Brene Brown training for the Daring Way last summer in San Antonio where it was hot. And uh, we were in the, you know, it was like during break and I had just gone to the bathroom and I walk out of the bathroom and this really cute peppy blonde comes up to me and she said, did you do (laughs) B-School? Clearly I didn't do my homework. I was like, no, I am the only female coach on earth who has not done (laughs) B-School. You guys might not know what B-School is, but... Um, We ended up, and this is what personal development people do, especially when you're at a conference slash training for this type of work. We immediately started talking about our, like, pain stories. (laughs) Yep. Short circuit, baby. Yep. Yes. And that's actually the first question that that I wanted to to ask you and discuss with you is um, what Brene calls hot wiring a connection. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you actually, because if you if you guys go to um, Laura's YouTube page, she's got so many great videos on there. And um, you told a story in one of your videos about you were on a flight, like a long flight, and you yeah. were um, talking to the woman next to you. And I think we've all done this, you know. You're you're sharing your pain stories, and you're just totally connecting. And then afterward, um, you had what you call a vulnerability hangover. And then so tell us tell us more about that and what happened because I know like. Everyone listening can relate to what happened. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have a lot of vulnerability hangovers. I know this all too well. Um, But yeah, you know, just on a flight and uh, just asked a couple questions. And then by the end of the conversation, she knew everything about me. I knew everything about her. And, and, you know, I had that overwhelming feeling of uh, wanting to text or call and just say, well, you know, I didn't mean to say this. Or can you, can you not say this? Or can you not tell this? You know, I had this (laughs) uncomfortable feeling of, but you know, when I said this, I really meant, and you know, until I knew Brene's work, um, you know, I didn't really know what how to put words to what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I think the reason we do that is because we are just so desperate for intimacy. Right. right. You know, and we want it so badly that we're willing to short circuit it um, in a way that just, you know, 
the other person has no ability to, to hold it, right? Mm-hmm. They don't have any space to really say, okay, <laughs> I hear you and validate you. And they kind of just look at you like you're crazy, you know? Um, and then they end up telling stories about this one time when they were on a plane and this girl told them everything. <laughs> so, you know, that that tends to happen a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I think that too, I don't always think, and I, I'm curious, like I wonder what would Brene would say about this and maybe you know, but I don't always think that that's a bad thing thing agreed like the hot wiring connection I think that and and it definitely I'm sure everyone listening has experienced that time when it's backfired when you've told someone brand new a story or if you're like on a first date with someone and um I've done it um sitting in I had a brand new hairdresser when I first moved to Utah and I I told her that I had just gotten sober and like I seriously had been sober for like three minutes Uh and and she was just like "Uh uh-huh uh-huh and like and they get it all the time, I'm sure. But I just was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? So I, we've all been there. But but again, like I think that sometimes it's OK. Yeah. And, you know, coming from a family of therapists, you know, I thought I had this vulnerability thing in the bag, right? Like I know how to talk to people. I know how to get everything <laughs> it's like you had like a secret VIP pass it for is, vulnerability. It is. Like I should be in the FBI. I am that brilliant. That's what I thought. And, you know, I thought uh, – it was really great. And I do think it's a gifting. I mean, I think it's part of being a therapist is, you know, being able to talk and listen, but you know, there are just the vulnerability hangovers that I wish I could kind of, uh, get sober from that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think my point that I want to might make with this topic is that it's totally normal to feel that way, you know, to walk away from a conversation. I think even if it's someone that, you know, has earned the right to hear our story and we tell it, and even if they, it was met with empathy and it was, and you feel really good, you know, the next morning you might be like, oh my God, maybe I should have said it different. And what are they, what are they thinking? So I think that like the point I want to get across to all of you listening is that it's completely normal to have these vulnerability hangovers. And because you just, you just were really intimate with somebody Mm -hmm. and, and it's something that we're not used to. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. It's 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 new and it's a muscle to be flexed. And I think that I think that here's where it can go awry. And I think a lot of my listeners probably can relate to this too. Is that a lot of times I believe that we view vulnerability as black or white. Right. Either we sure. dump out all of like we get completely naked on the first date. Yeah. Or we don't date at all. Or we don't tell anybody anything. We we have these walls and we just sort of like pretend that we don't have shit. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is where exactly, Andrea, I'm glad that you said that point. Because it just goes back to just being scared of who we are and scared of our stories that someone out there is is not going to understand, you know, and the mm-hmm. judgment comes in and the comparison comes in and the, I'm not doing it good enough kind of comes in. And so I think that's why most of us struggle with perfectionism. Right. Um, Just when we kind of go into that, uh, you know, we're scared of our own stories. Yeah. And so it's like, I don't want anyone to know that I, you know, I I have pain, that I have struggle, that I am not perfect. So I'm just not going to tell, I'm not going to connect with anyone. I'm just going to isolate. It's a big common problem with, um, with that my audience deals with. So instead of reaching out when they're having a hard time, they keep things to themselves and completely disconnect. And so I would love to know what advice do you, licensed therapist, Laura Probasco, have? <laughs> All those letters, baby. They're wonderful. <laughs> what advice do you have for women, um, the, the common issue and struggle of choosing to isolate instead of reaching out? Yeah. You know, like I mentioned, I think the bottom line with isolation is that we are scared that somehow our story is going to be too much or not Mm. enough. So like you kind of talked about the black and white feeling, we either feel like our stories are bigger or more destructive, or we've done more things that were wrong, or we feel like we haven't achieved anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So we really feel like kind of this isolation and, um, of both of those two pieces. And so when we feel overwhelmed, you know, even Brene says we end up hustling for approval, you know, and that doesn't feel good either. So isolation tends to be our only kind of option, right, to keep ourselves safe and to protect that. So, you know, my biggest thing with isolation is even taking that a step further is we start to cut out people that are loved ones in our lives because we're just so scared they're going to figure they're going to figure our shit out Mm -hmm. that we don't have it together. Right. That we're still 
You know, if only they knew that we battle with being a mother every day, if only they knew that we doubt our marriage, if only, if only, if only. Um, and so it's really about figuring out a couple of people or, you know, those marbled are people, <laughs> as we say, you know, to really sit in the dark with you. But, but more so than just sitting in the dark, it's about allowing people to pursue you in that isolation. Um, and I don't think there's very many people that we can allow that to happen with. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, and you mentioned your marble jar friends, and that's that's actually a metaphor in metaphor. the daring way. And yep. what what that basically means is that one, if you're really lucky, two, but that one person yeah. that has earned the right to hear your story because it is an honor to yeah. be able to be that person. Like if you're that person um, for someone else, or <laughs> you know you have that person, your um you, this this particular friend, and I think that um. I think that I completely forgot what I was going to say right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good point. It'll come back it to me. So me good. Second. It was so good. But yeah, I mean, there is an earning or like a badge of honor to really be able to sit with somebody in their darkness mm-hmm. and sit with somebody in their pain and really not fix it. It's not about right. fixing. Mm-hmm. It's not about advice giving. It's really about just holding them, you know, closely. Holding um, the space, as we like to say. Yes. Yes. I remember uh-huh. what I was going to say. I think... Here's what's common, what I hear a lot with women, and it's happened in my own experience, as I'm sure with you too, Laura, is that we get to a certain age and we have been burned by friends. So, and when I say burned, it could mean that you share a story with someone and you don't get what you were looking for. And it could have looked like, like you were saying, like they tried to fix it. They tried to give you advice. They tried to poo-poo it and tell you it wasn't that bad. They could one-up you, which holy shit. Like, nobody likes that. Um, <clears throat> they could point the blame at someone else when really all you want is to be seen and heard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at a, at a really, like, kind of surface level, like, we don't know exactly, like, what it is that we want. We do know, like, we want to connect with someone. And that's why we're telling this story. And when we don't get it, what happens is that we don't ever go after it again because we're yeah. like, okay, no one's going to understand. I'm just going to get, I'm just going to get burned again like I did before. So I'm just going to keep it to myself. And so, you know, this is one of those things where <clears throat> like Brene teaches us, like you can have courage or you can have comfort. Mm-hmm. Like you can't have both at the same time. And, and I wrote a blog post about, about isolation and what I said at the end, which really resonated with a few people that both outcomes are dreadful. Like either yeah. we, yeah stay in isolation and we are alone and we are disconnected and it's like that's like a you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs like we need that connection from people or the other option is to risk telling our story and being vulnerable and being exposed both outcomes are extraordinarily uncomfortable so yeah yeah that's why they're courageous exactly and that's why it's you know saying how are you to somebody, you know, and really actually listening is a courageous act, Mm -hmm. as simple as it seems. And so I I think the excruciating pain about it is, you know, that's, that's the beauty of life, right? Um, You know, Monastery calls it the brutal, right? That it's, it's beautiful and brutal at the same time. And so I think that, you know, if we figure those things out, and we continue pushing ourselves on, that's where we find the beauty in it, the beauty in the mess. Yeah, I always say, um, In humanness, there is such a human mess and we all have it. And I think that a lot of times the people who are acting like they don't have any of it are the ones that need help probably the most in that moment. Yeah. The ones that are disconnecting. So if that's you listening. Yep. um, What we encourage you to do, team Laura and Andrea, go team. Go team. (laughs) Well, and you know, and I I like people to have solutions from from these podcasts as much as possible is to really think about, because it doesn't always have to be a brand new friendship because those are, they take time and they're nurtured over time and it's a process. But if you have like that one person in your life who, um, who's maybe been a really good friend to you and you just don't talk to her that much anymore, I invite you to reach out to her Mm -hmm. and Ask for what you need. I think it's so interesting how we don't do that, like in our friendships. You know, we're encouraged to do it in our partnerships, in our intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to friendships, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't know if I'm living in a bubble, but I don't see it as much. Like I was never given the advice to do that. And um, the friendships I had in my 20s were so different from the friendships I have now at nearly 40, where 
I just, I didn't know how to ask for what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And maybe I kind of did, but like I didn't, I was so afraid of not getting it. So I'm like, I'll just, I'll just take what I can get. And it's not, it wasn't their fault. The friends that I had in my twenties, I, I adored them. And oh my God, did we have so much fun, but we just didn't know how to be amazing quote unquote marble jar friends to each other. So mm-hmm. I encourage you to just have that really probably a little bit awkward conversation of, Hey, you know what? Like I adore you and you are my very best friend. And, um, I want to show up for you best I can. Um, I'm giving you guys a little script here, so take notes. <laughs> and <laughs> Write it down. Um, when I share something really, really hard, I love it when you do this and you fill in the blank. Um, and just open that conversation because it will deepen your friendship. Yeah, I have a friend, you know, who is my marble jar friend, and we say – we do difficult conversations. I mean, that is our phrase. Like we do hard conversations and they're not always pretty and they're very awkward. And we started off with, okay, this is our difficult time, you know? And it, it, it just really allows me to know more about myself and with her. Mm-hmm. Right. So I know when I, when I ask for what I need and I either don't receive it or I do receive it, there's still such a beautiful honoring of myself with the asking. Yeah. Yep, definitely. <clears throat> I'll post a link in the show notes, you guys. Uh, yourkickasslife.com forward slash four or five. And there's a link to a past podcast I did. I did it with my best friend and where um, we talked about like how to have an amazing friendship. Because I think that like a lot of times we don't know. And it's not your fault. You've just probably never had it modeled for you or like never taken the class if there is one. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I must have missed that one too. I totally did. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to have it modeled for me. And, you know, you're probably lucky enough to be a therapist and know all of these tools. But for like the rest of us, it's like you just you just don't know. So that'll be there for you in the show notes. And switching gears a little bit, you have a YouTube video that I love where you talk about the hardest breakup you ever had was breaking up with yourself. So can you tell us about that and about the aha moments that you talked about in that particular video? Yeah, it's one of my favorites that I've done. Um, I did that probably about eight months ago. Um, It was pretty profound for me. Um, You know, I had spent 30 plus years uh, in pain and shame. And, you know, I just wanted to blame others or situations or breakups or friendship breakups Mm -hmm. or whatever. I wanted to blame something for the pain, right? There always had to be something that uh, had a reason for it, Um, And really, Andrea, I just got to the point where I ran out of people and things to blame, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, there just wasn't enough. It was like, my sister's like, you can't blame me another time, okay? This is your shit, okay? No more. (laughs) I didn't do it. (laughs) I did not do it. Um, And it really got to the point where I had to take a really hard look in the mirror and say, I am in charge of my love story with myself. And I continue to have my heart broken, not by anybody else, but by me. Um, and so the biggest breakup I ever went through was with myself and just learning that I could not embrace my story. I could not embrace my imperfections and I just deemed myself so unworthy of love. Mm-hmm. And so therefore <laughs> I searched high and low in all different places and all different things to try to find it. Um, but it was the aha was really that I have to be in charge of my own love story and I'm worthy of it. Yeah, I you know I, I you know I have the same story. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I stopped you, Andrea. I knew it. <laughs> You're like that was your cue, um, <clears throat> and I was clearing my throat. So I yeah, same same exact story, a little bit different circumstances, but I love that you had the wherewithal to to kind of realize like uh, that you were that it was a worthiness thing for me I didn't I knew something was wrong like I knew same thing like I was done blaming everybody and I was like okay there's a pattern in all of my suffering and it's me (laughs) yeah I am the center of all of this so um for me it was it was like going through codependence anonymous and um and going into coach training and doing this doing you know, a lot of personal development work where I finally was like, oh my God, like worthiness. Like I had never even, I don't even think I had ever even heard that word. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it looked like. Like for me personally, I thought it was everyone else's job mm-hmm. to deem me worthy. Mm-hmm. I I esteemed myself. I got my own worth through the eyes of others. Yeah. And what that looked like in my adult life, in my childhood, it was great. 
because my parents right. loved the shit out of me. You know what? It worked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then when I became an adult, I looked to my intimate partnership where it was, you know, just basically one person. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, was either on or off. And, uh, yeah, just did yeah. not work. You know, and I, I look back at my twenties now and I'm like, oh my God, no wonder I was such a right. mess. So <clears throat> I think that, um, I love that. I love that you had that aha moment and you had that, the wherewithal. And, um, I love the topic of worthiness. I think that, you know, you and I were just, Laura and I were talking about this before, before we started recording. And I think also, Worthiness is not one of those things. I don't, this might be a misconception of you guys listening, but it's not one of those things where like we just get there and we're like, I'm worthy. This is great over here. Right. It's a continual, continual process. Yeah. Yeah. Come on in. The water's great. Like n- you don't stay there. Like it, right. it's like a, it is a little bit of a roller coaster depending on the person, I think. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and, and, yeah. and you know what I have found to be true as well is it can look different your level of worthiness can look different like in in relationships, in your career, as a parent, mm-hmm. as a daughter, like all of these different roles that you have in your life. Um because I know like for me, like when stuff gets up leveled, I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast, like when stuff gets up leveled in my business, it's like I take a tumble backwards and I'm like, "Oh my god, I need to look at this all over again." Mm-hmm. So it, like you said, yeah, it's a continual process. Continual process. And I think that, you know, we just don't have the luxury as human beings of arriving at worthiness. You know, that's just not something that happens. We don't arrive and then we're worthy. And then that's checked off the list as self growth, right? Mm-hmm. Like that, that doesn't happen. So we have battle wounds, right? And and those wounds and scars are of bravery and courage to continue to get back there mm-hmm. and to continue to ask, okay, where am I at with my, with my feeling of being loved by self really? Right. Mm-hmm. And it's such a buzzword right now, self-love, self-love, and it's kind of cheesy, but it's really the whole, you know, it's, it's kind of the paradigm of, of how we learn how to love others. Too. Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. The, like the foundation of happiness. It, it truly is. It truly is. And it wasn't, you know, I remember being seven years old and writing down lists of people that potentially might not like me and what I needed to bring to them to, you know, get uh. their stamp of approval. And, you know, the list might've stopped, but that still thinking continued my whole life. Um, and so when we look outside, like again, that same quote, when we look outside for our worthiness, we're just hustling over Mm -hmm. and over for someone to choose us, someone to pick us, someone to say we're okay. Right. Yeah. And that is uh, an exhausting way to live. I know because I lived it for years and years. I know. And and probably a lot of you listening are, are living that. And so I think like what, what I would tell you listening, if that's you is just to, um, really my favorite tool there is like to, to make a list. Um, and I, my seven day challenge just ended and, um, it, I'll, we'll do it again in June. And this is one of the exercises in there actually is to make a list of the criteria that you have made up in your mind that you've probably never thought about before, but it's there, it's floating around. Like what, what do you think? Like when you have arrived at worthiness, like what's going on in your mind? So for a lot of people, it's like when I lose 20 pounds, I'll be worthy. When I get married, I'll be worthy. Mm-hmm. When I um, make six figures, when I get a promotion, when I, you know, all of these little things that we make up that really like there are no prerequisites for worthiness and your worthiness is non-negotiable. Right. You just are. Right. right. Yeah. And I think that that is the story that we make up in our head, right? Is the shoulds and enough. Mm-hmm. And and that we feel like still, even at that, we still feel like we'll, we'll have an arrival time. And, you know, aha moments are beautiful and great, but they continue to happen your whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a continuum. I mean, yeah. it's a continuum. Yeah. And I know, you know, like if you look at all these like super successful women in, and, and all of them, I guarantee you all of them still work on themselves continually continually yeah can't stop can't Can't stop won't stop (laughs) we won't (laughs) we do sing on the yorkic gas live podcast i don't know if i if i prepped you for that there there is usually singing (laughs) well i guess i just got initiated anytime you feel like it you can break out into song um okay so I want to know in your own journey of self-growth, and even if you've already mentioned it, just tell us what has been your best tool that you use? Like, like what's your go-to if you have one? 
Yeah. You know, I, I really like this question because um, it – it's kind of where we're all moving, and I think it's more and more acceptable now, the idea of spirituality, the idea of whatever your higher power is, whatever that looks like. I think, you know, the two lessons that I learned when I was probably, I don't know, in grade school is that we pray to talk, and we're still, or we meditate to listen. Mm -hmm. And the listening is really where I think the juice, the juices are, right? The meat of the bone kind of comes in our practices, but the juices are those still moments is where we really can listen to self and we can listen to spirit or whatever that may look like. And so I feel like my go-to has to be the idea of being uh, really still within um, so that I can hear, right? Mm -hmm. We don't spend any time <laughs> stopping, you know, which is where, again, we've talked about perfectionism. And I have a really hard time with that. I, I, mean, yeah. I know you're probably surprised. I'm very surprised. <laughs> there would be any chaos going in on that brain of yours at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really hard practice. I mean, I think it's probably the the hardest practice in the world. I mean, taking thirty to thirty seconds to a minute to be still, we don't do it. Mm -hmm. We don't <clears throat> car. We don't do it when we're going to the bathroom. We don't. I mean, we don't do it in the shower. I mean, we don't do it. And really, truly, it's the best practice I think for us to find some mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this fast-paced world, and I know, like, you know, my, my ass-kicking women listening, they are go-getters. And I what I have found is, and I'll put a link in the show notes, you guys, like, and if you've listened to my podcast for any length of time, you know that me and meditation, we've had a tumultuous relationship. Um, <laughs> I'd I, love to witness. I, I broke up with yoga a long time uh -huh. ago. Uh -huh. <clears throat> we broke up, like, last year. Okay. But meditation, I've, I've like, I've, I'm still trying. I'm still trying. We keep getting yep. back together. And... Um, I love the app, um, Headspace. Uh -huh. Do you know uh -huh. this app? I have heard of this app recently, but I do not know as much as you're going to tell me. Okay, here we go. So it's just really go. great. And maybe I'm a sucker for a man with a British accent, but it helps. <laughs> <laughs> that would definitely and be Australian. Healthy. Stop oh. it. Oh, my God. I can't. Okay. So it's, I don't, I, I'm forgetting his name, but he created this app and, um, it's like a 10 session journey that you go on and each lesson is only 10 minutes so I'm on like the sixth one right now and I started it like <laughs> a month ago but I'm doing it I'm doing it and I've actually You're done it two there. days in a row now that You're um, still showing up yeah I'm showing up and I really really like it because he talks about I mean it is for beginners so if you are like you know, if you're seasoned in meditation, this probably isn't for you. But mm -hmm. for the beginners, I love that he allows you to, like, let your thoughts run away sometimes. He just gives mm -hmm. you permission because yep. it's really about a practice. I mean, that's why they call it a meditation practice. That's why they call right. it a yoga practice. I know, I know. But um, <laughs> it's about learning how to do it, like, as a beginner. And, like, I used to make up that meditation was, like, you go – you have your eat, pray, love moment mm -hmm. and you go to India. Yeah. Make sit. a big deal. Uh -huh. Or you go on a 10-day silent meditation. For sure. <laughs> and I think that's what we all think. And, and if I could do that and afford it and take breaks, I mean, it would be wonderful. But I, I think that that's, meditation can start just by waking up in the morning and not grabbing your phone. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And I, I think it's just that's where we find the real honesty of who we are. And um, it's allowing, you know, we have to get out of our own way. I mean, that's the biggest thing here, Andrew, is like we are so much in our own way and we want a to-do list. We want a checklist. We want to be able to check it off because that feels so much better. Right, right. And the opposite of being able to have no control, you know, um, or release that control, the big word surrender that control is really scary. Surrender, you know, I, I've made it no secret that surrender is my hardest practice, <clears throat> yeah. but the most important for me and yeah. one that I resisted. Um, and one that is so important, oh my God, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, I do. so much. Yeah. So I'm getting that word tattooed on my arm, like within the next month. And, um, it. it's, it's really, you know, in terms of, of meditating and, uh, what I do too, I just want to add one thing on to tag on to what you were just saying is that I sometimes, and you know, this gets tricky because I know you are like homebodies with Jesus. Like you are a Christian and that's your thing. But a lot of people listening, 
they're like, I don't know. And, you know, either they grew up with yeah. religious dogma and they've yeah. run away from it, it or they just have never had that kind of like spiritual background. But I mean, I don't care what you believe in. Exactly. I just think it's like if it's any kind of energy outside of yourself, yeah. like if you believe to me, I believe in love and mm-hmm. I believe love is so powerful and like how could there not be something out there right. and so right. that's what I pray to and yeah. um I I ask for wisdom to get dropped mm-hmm. on me because when it happens I create magical things right. um I mean really that's like where the book came from it's where I met my husband that way just all sorts of extraordinary things so Sometimes like in, in, in a moment, like when I feel it and I'm like, if I'm having like an overwhelming feeling of gratitude, I will stop in the kitchen. Like I'll be by myself or in the car or in the shower. And I just like ask for silence and just yeah. like give me whatever it is that I need to have in order to do great work in this world. Yeah. That's like yeah. my go-to prayer. It is, and that's, that's the whole act, right? That's the act of surrender of, you know, there's something out there, whatever you believe that is. That's greater than, you know, my kitchen sink here right now. Mm -hmm. And, and the the practice of gratitude is really the practice of honoring it and honoring love. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And okay. So what would you tell me what you would do if you had a client who is like super, super, super struggling with surrender? What would you tell her? You know, I, I like this question as well, too. You've got good ones. I know. Uh, I try. So you do. Radio. You did a great job. <laughs> you know, and I, I love that you said, I mean, both I think you and I have a similar personality of, you know, surrender is a difficult thing. It is by far one of the hardest crutches in my life. And, you know, control was my best friend forever. I loved her. She did a lot well, of great BFFs things too. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's definitely was my BFF, you know, and she went into, you know, body image, friendships, relationships, numbing, all of those things. But I think why it's so hard to surrender control is because it also allows us to excel. It also allows us to get a lot of shit done. Mm -hmm. It allows us to be very successful. It allows us to be, you know, mom and working and wife and, you know, all of these roles. And so it's a double-edged sword of feeling like control can really make us successful. It sounds counterintuitive. It is. Mm -hmm. It's a false sense of success, right? Because the moment that that one thing doesn't go well or that one, you know, dinner that we plan for our husband is burnt or, or the fight happens right before it's supposed to be this great thing, you know, we lose it and our crick rate comes out, you know, and we then go back to this whole cycle of shame and all of those things. So, you know, when I'm working with clients, there's just really not a one, two, three of surrender, right? right? I know, right? The magic- <laughs> I know the audience is well, wanting- forget it then. Get the podcast paper over. out. Get the paper out. One is, um, <laughs> yeah. No, I think it really is the opposite. I think it is. We get so tired and weary of the weight of control and the weight of not surrendering that it's the only thing that makes us wave the white flag. You know, people who surrender are the ones in life who've waved the white flag, and I think. What I do know about control is maybe I've been successful in those things and maybe it's gotten me through other things. But what I know is that I never had peace and I never had freedom while I was doing it. Word up. Word up. I mean, just right. Surrender is an idea of freedom. It's hard as it is. So I love that you use that word too, because in, in my personal development work, I realized one of my most important values and if you do you know Danielle Laporte's work <clears throat> core desired feeling as she would call them is freedom yeah and what's interesting is what I found out is that my grip on control was completely taking me in the opposite direction because I felt yeah. like if I could control things then I could have more freedom because it would all right. go my way right right <laughs> it right certainly doesn't <laughs> and it certainly doesn't yeah and that like if you've experienced the richness of letting go, whether it's just of one little thing, that really allows you to have that buzzword again of self-love. Like, mm-hmm. I can do hard things. Yeah. I can do this. Well, and I think I, I want to point something out because I, I can kind of hear people listening and thinking this, you know, because, again, my people like to think in terms of black or white. So Got control it. does not – I mean, surrender does not mean that you let everything – go and you are just like you know you put everything in everybody else's hands and you just like say fuck it whatever right. it doesn't matter right. whatever happens happens I don't have to go to work today <laughs> you know <laughs> no it's right. about doing what you can and mm-hmm. 
doing your best to be unattached to the outcome. So what that would look like is say you're about to have a conversation, a hard conversation with your partner or even like a coworker or boss or something like that. You have, like you would not be human, you know, if you didn't have like, like a desired outcome. Like I want it to go like this. I want them to respond this way. I want them to react this way. I want them to say this. So surrendering would look like, okay, so I am going to show up and I'm going to do my part. I'm going to come into this conversation and be proud of the woman that I am when I showed up. And however they react is really up to them. Yeah. Exactly. Not attached to the outcome. I love that. That's exactly what it is. Oh, that's hard. But it's that is such freedom. I, I know I've used it this is. example before on a past uh, past podcast. Um, when we were living in Utah, and I I did want to. I didn't see us living there forever, and I and I wanted to move, and I I let it go. I did I did I did really well for a couple of years, and then I started to get antsy. You know, it's like my son was was in kindergarten. He was going to be in first grade, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go. Universe. P.S. Like, can you make it happen faster? So I was like kind of finding myself like bugging my husband about like, you know, have you looked for their jobs lately? Blah, blah, blah. And like starting to go into that cycle of wanting to go on to online for him and like really push him and nag him about it. And um, what I did, like it, I, I just really had to get into a place of, OK, Andrea, it's going to work out and mm-hmm. it'll be OK. And you need to just let it go and surrender that wherever you're going to end up, you're going to end up and the universe is going to show up for you. And so I'm not even kidding, like not even a month after that happened, he got a phone call and we ended up in North Carolina. So, and it's really interesting. Like I think about the woman I used to be in my twenties and it's like, I'm scared of her. (laughs) Well, how exhausting was that? It was so exhausting. exhausting. People were afraid of me. Yeah. Well, you'd kind of look like, you know, a bee with something else. You know what I mean? I mean, you're walking around looking like I was a complete scary. bitch. Well, like, yeah. for instance, like my, my first wedding <clears throat> to my ex-husband, I made everyone wear pink to my um, – <laughs> I mean, talk about like I was one of those bridezillas. Like it was out of control. Oh, I can picture that. People oh, were like, you need to settle down. Like people were afraid <laughs> to call me. So – and, you know, that's like kind of an extenuating circumstance, but – I wanted to control things so badly and it just yeah. like that was a prison. It was absolutely yeah. a prison. Yeah. Well, cuz the control if we go back to what we've been talking about actually can act like a self-worth, right? Mm-hmm. If I control this and it looks a certain way, then I am worthy of this or I'm, you know, I am worthy of getting married and having this big wedding and that means everyone's going to love me if they're wearing pink, right? Because that's what I need, you know. Mm-hmm. And if they do what I say, that means they love yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. If they do it, yeah, they do what I say if they act the part, you know, and, and so we, if we script out our life, then we're just missing all the beauty in it, you know, and we're not surprised and we don't, not to mention have, like lose friendships and not have connection yeah. because people don't want to hang out with you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when you're like that, you're disconnected. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for being here and talking about this super, super important stuff. So as we close up, tell everyone where they can find you. You know, they can find me at Probasco, which is my last name is crazy and associates.com. You can find me at YouTube, Laura Probasco, and you can find me at fearlessfemales.com. And everyone, um, if you go to your kickasslife.com forward slash four, five, The show notes are there and all the links to the things we talked about and how to find more of Laura and get on her YouTube channel. And also registration is open for my um, Kick-Ass Courage Project Masterclass, which is my signature program. Yay! It's open right now until I believe the 24th. You have to apply for a spot. So come on over and check that out as well. And that's all we have for you today. And I will see you next time. In the meantime, see you out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.